right, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Isaac Bronco. This is part two of our webinar series this spring. Uh, tonight's topic will be building a contractual relationship with your producer. And we have three panelists tonight. We have Ron and Beth Wolf from Wolf Suffix, uh, Trisha and Donna Fearing from Fearing Cattle Company, and Spitz, uh, Spencer worked from Six and One Meats. Uh, so we got a diverse group of people tonight. Uh, we originally had another processor scheduled, but that fell through. He's traveling internationally. Um, so thanks to Spencer for filling in for us. Uh, glad to have you here. Um, as with any business relationship, it's important to build uh, a, uh, a good, good interaction with your processor, especially when it comes to developing a local meats program. Um, as you're relying on them to get that meat out and ready and processed for your customers. Um, and so without further ado, we'll start with our first panelist tonight. Uh, Ron and Beth Wolf will give a little bit of a background over themselves and their operation. Uh, and then we'll continue on with Trisha and Don, Donnie Fearing. And then we'll uh, finish off with Spencer Work before opening it up to questions from the panelists or from the audience tonight. Um, if you want to go ahead and start, Ron and Beth, that'd be great. Well, thanks, Isaac, for inviting us to be part of this first and foremost. I think it's an honor always to be uh, asked and, you know, share what we think we know. But uh, Wolf Suffix has been something that has been around for 40 some years, which started out as a 4-H and FFA project. And it's a hobby that has gone kind of wild on us. We currently are running about 85 head of registered Suffolk ewes and that that has gotten a little bigger than we wanted but an opportunity come upon us this winter and we bought out a dispersion and so we're in the seed stock business first um and we just completed uh two weeks ago our 19th annual production sale and, and so we're, we're trying to sell rams and ewes at a, you know around the country and and we were fortunate enough, like we just talked a little bit ahead of this, that we had the national champion Suffolk U this past uh, November. And so it, it's kind of changed a little bit about, you know, our, our audience. But uh, not all the sheep that we have in our place are show sheep or breeding stock. And, and thanks to my wife here, and I don't remember, uh, six years ago, uh, she decided that we needed to try something different because we are fairly close to a, a livestock barn in Aberdeen, 60 miles away. But when you only go with 10 head or less of fat lambs, you're sometimes at the mercy of how many they need. And, and we weren't always, you know, what we thought we were getting the best price we could available. And so she started exploring a few options for us and, and farmer's market was something that we, uh, you know, looked into and she pursued. And so we went with that and, and to preface this a little bit, or I will say in the back end, we've had five years in a row now that we have not marketed a, a lamb at the sale barn. So we have gotten to price every sheep that has left this place. And so be it in cuts or holes and halves or breeding stock. And so we kind of are able to control our market. Now, this year with the extra lambs, I hope that's still the case, but um, you know, that uh, that has been working well for us. And we have uh, some, relate, uh, some relationships with a couple of restaurants in Fargo. And that is where we do our farmer's market. We only do one uh, just because of a time constraint mainly. Uh, it's work being, you know, and we'll probably talk about that next week, but uh, doing that is a lot of work uh just in a time frame and then getting everything ready and so in a nutshell i guess you know that is where we want to be uh one thing about being doing this so we have a commitment that you know we're going to have to fatten our lambs be it whatever the feed price is and, and so yeah seven dollar corn is not a favorite to buy but you know we have customers and expectations are looking for us and so we can't bail on our lamb crop because I think, you know, our feeling is, and Bethel, I'll let her take over here shortly. Our feeling is, is uh, if we, you know, tend to back away, somebody else will step in and take it over. And, uh, you know, Beth's got some insight because she's more of the brains of the farmer's market. I'm, I just try to get them there. 
Well, I think that Isaac just wanted an introduction. So that I was think a big that, one, yeah. <laughs> I think Ron did a good job with that. Um, basically, I help out as much as I can. I help Ron with chores if I can. And um, our girls are part of our, our program. And it all boils down to what we're going to learn tonight. And that's really having a good relationship with your processing plant. And, you know, we're lucky that we do have a processing plant just nine miles away from us. Not a lot of producers are not that lucky. So we try and we try and keep Dalton happy. He tries to keep us happy. I don't, I think that's probably. And, and I don't know, go ahead, Isaac, and, and direct us what you want us to, you know, to go on. Um, one thing about it uh, with our, we probably, and, and I don't know, Spencer's probably got a better thumb on it, but it's hard to find processing plants that'll butcher lambs. And we are seeing that, and now we've got some friends in Western North Dakota that are bringing their lambs down there. I know some people up by Grand Forks um, that a lot of processing plants don't want to deal with this. And, and we've been fortunate because the local one here is federally inspected, which is important to us. It, you know, and having a meat license, we either need to be state or federal. When we started, it was state, and and this plant has gone through the third ownership since we've done this, and, and so we've had to make relationships with the, the new owners, and uh, sometimes their you know flexibility um, is you know give and take on both people, parts of it, and. And I think the thing that we're fortunate enough is we have a product that doesn't need to hang in the locker a long time. And so, uh, you know, we're conscientious about it because we know locker space is a big thing uh, for a lot of these is when our product is ready to go, we try to get it picked up and get it out of there. And I know that plays well with them because we're freeing up space for them. Yeah, no, um, I guess uh, would I a question I would have is, uh, do you guys mind explaining how you got started uh, building that that one-on-one uh, you know, -on -one relationship with your processor? You want to take this? Well, I Ron probably sees them more than I do. Typically, to be honest, when they hear from me, it's usually a phone call that they're not real excited to get because I'm very picky. I'm very picky about how our product look, how our label looks, how the packaging, the whole, you know, how things are cut. And so Dalton knows that if I'm calling after we've picked up the meat, then he needs to like, we need to have a conversation about what I liked, what I didn't not like. And he's young and he's willing to learn. And um, he, he understands, you know, if, if I feel that like our girls had a roast the other night that they had a lamb and they sent us a picture and I'm like, uh, you make sure you send me that picture because I want to talk to Dalton about the way that roast was cut because I was not happy with it. And he'll be like, OK, you know, I'm I'm sorry that that happened. And now that I know what you want, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it better. He's done an excellent job with our with our packaging with our logo. I'm, I'm really tickled about that. He does a great job with um, trimming the, the meat so he, he does not leave a lot of fat on there. I mean, we our lambs are very lean the way it is, but still sometimes it's like, okay, that, that might have been a little too much fat. Um, the, first, the first owner, we had known him for years. He had been there well, since we've been raising lambs, I, I kind of feel like he's always, you know, so then when we decided to get our, to get our license, he was probably the most helpful getting us going, telling us what, what we needed to do. And, you know, we had, a, we had a great relationship with him. The second owners happened to be daycare parents of mine. So we had already had a relationship established. And so working with them went, went very well as well. And then with the current owner, like I said, he does a great job. And Ron honestly has the most face-to-face, -face, you know, I'll call and I'll tell him how I want, how I want the lambs done. And, 
Like this year, I've decided I'm going to pretty much just have a standard. I'm going to go in, have a face to face with him because sometimes we're a little something between the, the person that takes the phone call and the person that cuts the meat. Once in a while, there's some kind of a hiccup. And so I want to make sure that that we work through that. And this is what his only second. But he, yeah, he was the meat cutter over the last, but um, from the last owners. But I'd like to, you know, the thing is, the expectations for us is we went in and scheduled, or I did, my butcher dates back in December. I think it was December or even the end of November, just to guarantee that I had a spot uh, there, a monthly spot. And, and they appreciated that. And I mean, we took the time and we went through and and we tried to get it, you know, a month apart and and talk about, you know, the amount of lamb we have and and the communication as we get closer, they let me know, you know, are you ready to come with these? And and they're flexible enough if I want to try to slide one in, an extra one, or I'll call them and say, you know, I don't have that extra one. I'm going to be one short. And they like that because then you know, it, it gives them an opportunity to maybe let somebody else come in on, you know, because they have so many they can do a day uh, when they do it. Um, but, you know, like Beth said, the, the fortunate thing for us is they are right in town. And the next closest one that I would know, I might have to put 40, 50 miles on to get a lamb butcher and, and you know, under an inspection. And so the convenience is important. And, and the fact that it is convenient to us uh, makes it probably a little more the give and take on our end of it, just because we appreciate the convenience too. Yes. Awesome. Um, thank you for uh, that insight. That's, that's really good. Uh, um, yeah, no, uh, it sounds like you guys have had developed a pretty good relationship and the federal inspection is a great tool to have in your, uh, and it, you know, and it's nice for us going into those two restaurants or whatever, to have that stamp on there. Plus we do some in the South Dakota and it just, you know, gives us a little more freedom, you know, that we don't even think about until you look at the package and, there that stamp is, and, and that opens up the border or whatever, you know, right. or you, you go to the restaurant and you have it and, and they can trust that product then, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, so that's, that's awesome. a good thing. Yeah. Um, well, I guess we'll move on to Trisha and Donnie if uh, they're ready. Um, just if you guys want to introduce yourselves, give a little background and then talk about uh, your experiences uh, with your processor. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us on here. I I guess I got stuck doing the introduction. Um, we are a, a family operation. Uh, we got started in uh, together in 1998 uh, when we got married. Um, I grew up uh, registered in a commercial Angus operation. Um, so we were always kind of marketing some bulls and some females along the way. Um, Trisha grew up on a Hereford ranch. Her dad also marketed some Hereford uh, Horned Hereford bulls and females along the way too. And so when we got started, um, we worked off the farm for a while. Uh, we had uh, lived in Towner, North Dakota for seven years. Um, we built our herd and then we were able to move and and uh, start uh, leasing a place, I guess, in 2007. And that got us started more with our cow calf operation. Meanwhile, we were selling bulls private treaty and also through sales. Um, we really got our things going, I guess, in 2012, uh, the place that we're on, um, we bought it and kind of got things more revved up, um, but we were not a huge operation, uh, run anywhere from 100 to 125 uh, uh, cows. And we're down a little bit now because of the drought, but we're trying to build back. Um, as we were marketing along, kind of the same as wolves, uh, as having as not as many steers and not as many females, uh, we're taking them to the sales barn. We were tired of kind of maybe not getting the true value for our genetics. Um, and that's kind of why we got started um, in the meat business, um, especially on call cows. 
We always felt like we were a nickel or dime less um, than what the market maybe was doing. And we felt like we could add value to them. And that's how we got started kind of in the meat business. And I'll let Tricia talk about that. So it was in 2015 that we started um, direct marketing. Um, we started off with like five head for that year. Um, we started with a processor in Mile City, Montana, was also a federal processor. We had a really good working relationship with them and things were going along really well. Um, we had been there for about five years. We're developing some value added products. And uh, anyway, the we went out there in April and they told us that they were selling the plant and they hadn't really told their employees this even, but um, within about a month to two months time period, we went from having scheduled uh, slots every month to having to call in every Monday morning and see if we could get slots, um, which they were bringing their own cattle from Billings to Mile City to have processed. So we kind of saw the writing on the wall that they were trying to, and there was numerous other producers that were bringing in four head a month um, on a consistent basis. And we had been visiting with them and we all kind of figured out what was going on. It was kind of the, we'll slowly push you out and, you know, do our own thing. Um, so we kind of went into panic mode. Um, we were able to get a few processing spots in uh, Hazen. Um, we had been visiting a little bit with them prior to uh, this happening and they were gracious enough to fit us in. Um, we also were able to get a few into Williston uh, both are federal plants. And so we kind of went through a transition period and about, I'm going to say it was July of 2020, uh, we were in Dickinson. Most of our direct marketing we do is over social media. We do a farmer's market here in Beach uh, during the summer. Um, but anyway, we were delivering meat uh, to Dickinson one night and another uh, producer pulled into the parking lot that was also delivering meat. And um, it just so happened to be some friends of ours from the Kildare area. So we started visiting with them and um, he asked us, he said, well, would you guys ever be interested in purchasing or buying in on a, a processing facility if you had the opportunity? And we kind of like, well, yeah, we definitely would consider it. And so about I don't know, maybe a week or two had gone by and they called us and were asking if we were interested. And so needless to say, we ended up um, purchasing part of six and one meats at New Salem. And that was in October of 2020. Um, we've been there obviously since then. Um, Spencer, I was joking around earlier. Now that you're on tonight, I can't talk about you. <laughs> no, I, Donnie and I, we are very fortunate um, after going through kind of that inconsistency there for a little while of not knowing how many, it's hard to have a business plan when you don't know when you can get animals in. Um, so right now we, we take uh, basically four head a month into six and one meets at New Salem, which for us, we're north of beach, uh, 12 miles. So it's 140 miles, about 140 miles that we travel to the processor. Uh, we make one trip down with cattle, and then we make another trip down to go pick up our beef. And um, it's it's a really good, we're in a good situation now. Um, but we also, uh, we also appreciate that good situation after having gone through the, you know, inconsistency of, of being able to find that processor. And I think a lot of people struggle with that, um, being able to own Part ownership in the business has been a huge advantage to us. Um, you kind of have that comfort of knowing from month to month where you're at, what dates you have. Spencer lays them all out in front of us for basically the whole entire year, which we know our date. We know what day we have to be there. Um, anything else you want to add? No, and just that relationship. I think as we've went along, it's it's so crucial to build those relationships, not only with your consumer, but also with like Spencer. Um, you know, we, <clears throat> that was the daughter of the owner out at Miles City. 
um, she did all the cutting instructions and, and she actually, I, you know, she did a lot for that plant out there and, and she didn't even know that her parents were selling the uh, plant, I think, until like a week before they had actually changed it over to hand. So it came by her kind of off guard. But uh, I think, and after dealing with Hazen and Willison, you just, you get used to uh, the way things are cut. And like you said, uh, I think uh, Wolf said too, is, is how things are presented and labeled and it, it's so crucial. The consumer wants a high quality product. They want it to be consistent. They want it to look the same, taste the same. Uh, and I think as, as you can build those relationships all the way through, it's, it's a, it's a win-win situation. And, um, you know, we, we learn something new, I think too, just about every time too, we're, we're still learning. Um, you know, uh, uh, it's trying to get cattle to to the right weights or carcass weights or or this or that or genetics. It, it's all intertwined. And and when you uh, have Mother Nature kick you in the butt like it did in 20 to 21 for us for the drought, uh, it really changes your whole perspective. But but I think uh, on the processing side, it, it's it's all about relationships and and keeping that door and communications open. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Uh, that, that was very informative and, um, it's, it's good to see we have, uh, Spencer with us tonight too, because he gets to share a little bit about, uh, his experiences too, with, uh, working with producers. Um, and I guess we'll go ahead and go to Spencer and then we'll get ready, uh, to open up for questions from the audience. Thanks, Isaac. Um, as I said, my name is Spencer Wirt. I am the uh, manager at Six and One Meats. Uh, before I came onto Six and One Meats, which would have been in January 2021, I uh, was at NDSU. I spent five years at NDSU managing the meat lab, either assistant manager or manager of the NDSU meat lab. Before that, I managed a, a shop in Bowdoin, North Dakota. Um, for a couple of years, um, right out of college. Um, I think, you know, Trish, Donnie, Ron, Beth, you all, uh, um, kind of hit it right on the head of, of, of how things need to go in, in your guys' shoes. So I've, I mean, I've managed a, a cooperatively owned butcher shop. I've I, now six and one meets is owned by six different people. So on the terms of, uh, you know, I think you titled this uh, webinar, one of the bullet points as a contractile relationship with your processor and, and Trish and Donnie are in a unique position because they're owners. Ron and Beth, it sounds like you guys just are awesome people and we're able to get <laughs> uh, awesome relationships built with your processors. But it is it is difficult because, well, both of you, um, for instance, one's beef, one's specifically lamb. And, and I think what uh, people who get into this meat direct selling, right, is don't quite realize that there is a hundred different ways to process an animal. There's a hundred different ways to present a steak or a chop or a roast or, you know, and that's, that's where that uh, trial and error honestly has to come through you as a producer with your processor because uh, explaining it right or, or sending it through an email or even trying to explain what you want over the phone is very difficult. Um, I'm trained in a certain way. The next butcher is going to be trained in a different way. We both have in our head what we want to present, what we want to package, but you at the end of the day, have the final say of what you want to sell to your customers. So, so getting on the same page is, is easier said than done. And it takes time. It takes a lot of communication. It takes sending pictures, um, Beth, that you, you know, described earlier and, and Trish and Donnie, we send pictures back and forth all the time. Um, technology has, I think really helped everything, right? You guys know that between, selling on social media, but then also resolving issues that occur because no matter what, there's not a processor out there that is not going to um, make a mistake because meat processing is not a, an exact science per se. Um, 
so yeah, getting your foot in the door with the processor, for instance, when I came in to six and one meets, uh, the previous owners had a lot of large customers that put through, uh, you know, that around 50 head a year. Um, the day I came on board, those producers stopped by the shop to introduce themselves because if they didn't have this facility to, con to continue their business, they were, um, well, kind of in the same shoes that Trish and Donnie were before they bought into six and one. Um, so that, that is an important, uh, aspect to really focus on, um, because change of ownership can change, can change everything mindset, uh, of that next owner on, on what's, what's, what are they, they focusing their business on, uh, six and one meets is, I don't want to say solely because we do process lambs, goats, pigs, things like that. But our, our main focus is beef. We're in, we're in cattle country and there's a huge demand for beef. Now, that being said, there are a lot of processors popping up across the state of North Dakota. And actually a lot of them are getting their federal inspection or their state inspection. So I think there's, there is more opportunity now as a producer to get into an inspected facility than there has been in the past, um, even two years, three years. So the opportunity is growing, um, but of course that 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 the biggest meat consumption in the state and 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 what's raised the biggest is beef, and I think that's what most um, facilities focus on. Um, we do other red meat species, so um, lambs, goats, and hogs once a month. Uh, we try to squeeze people in. That's one of those species that's very difficult to get a long-term schedule built because between slaughtering fabrication packaging then we have our value added line that for us for instance that's always one week you have 200 pounds the next you have a thousand so that scheduling on a, on a processor side becomes very difficult um and the uh, ron you mentioned that you know lambs don't take up much space which they don't that's the huge benefit of processing lambs but it's on a business standpoint um what what's hanging on that rail is also on a, on a processor side what we get paid on so you got to do 15 lambs for two beef per se it's probably a little less than that but uh, i think that's honestly one of the biggest reasons why a lot of processors don't do lambs um, but there is opportunity. And I think with this expansion in the state of all these plants opening up, I think there's going to be availability for all red, red meat species to be processed in all these plants. Hopefully that's just a theory of mine, but. Awesome. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, also insightful and it's great to have a processor um join us tonight and i guess we'll we got some questions on the chat board already and I'll, I'll go ahead and read them out loud um so we can get them for the recording that'll go on um to the youtube page so the first question we have is how much discount are you willing are you giving your restaurants and food service customers um Ron and Beth, if you want to, I, I see you gave a response kind of a, uh, in the chat if you want to build off that and kind of give your answers for that. Well, we don't. They, uh, you know, we sell, and, and then both of our relationships are the restaurants where people we met at Farmer's Market. And so the first product that they, you know, associated with us was what they bought, you know, at, at our Farmer's Market. and. And I really think, you know, we don't give a discount because of the fact that, uh, you know, we have a product, I think, priced very fairly. Um, and so uh, if we don't sell it there, we'd probably sell it to our customers. I, it's more of a convenience thing for us uh, that they're, you know, we don't have to travel very far to get to, to deliver it if we had to go somewhere to do it um you know and have the extra time and miles you know we could easily justify it but uh 
we just feel like, you know, our product is per fairly priced the way it was. If we look at, you know, what it is retail wise, be it at Walmart or stuff, or, you know, of those, you know, for American lamb, we're probably even cheaper. I mean, locally, the Walmart we have in, in Aberdeen, we're, our current prices are less than that. And then, so we just figure that we are offering a premium product, um, you know, and lamb isn't available for everybody. And not that we didn't think we have a corner on the market, but uh, we're, we charge them accordingly. And then looking at the menu, I think they still get their, their extra value out of it. And, and that's, you know, we've, we tried to, and I'll just say, you know, with the two restaurants, we tried to uh, support them back and eat there. You know, and it's fun to eat your own product that somebody else makes and it's on the menu. And, uh, but I, I truly think that, you know, for us, you know, we just sell it for what, you know, what we normally do. And we haven't had an issue with it. They haven't asked us for any. Like Beth says, uh, you know, every now and then we'll throw in a meat stick or, you know, something like that, or even throw in a, a coffee cup or something like that and let them know that we appreciate it. But they've never asked for it, and, and at this point in time, we see no reason that we have to offer it. When we awesome. decided to set our prices, it was important to me to put American lamb on the North Dakota consumer's table. But most of the people that I talked to when I said, you know, why don't you eat lamb? Everything I always heard was, well, I can't afford it. And it's it's too fancy of a meat. I, ju I just want to do beef and pork because I understand that. So I sat for a long time and looked at a lot of USDA um, pricings and suggested prices and things like that. And I just really felt that it was important. We need to make a profit above what we would get at the sale bar. I personally believe, and I kind of drug Ron along to that belief of we don't need to gouge our consumers. And, and I'm not saying that anybody that chooses to set their prices different, I'm not saying that the, that's what they're doing. I'm just saying, I just want to make, I just want to take that middleman out. I want to make a little bit more than we'd make at the sale barn. Yep. And that's what I'm happy with. Yeah, I just, if we made, I mean, we're just a small, small um, hobby farm. If we made any more than that, then the U.S. government would come after us even more. So it's like, <laughs> just make enough to cut out the middleman and get a little bit of money in our pocket. All right. Yeah, no, that's a great answer. Uh, I saw Trisha and uh, Donnie answered too from uh, the beef perspective. If you guys want to uh, build off a... Uh, of Ron and Beth, that'd be great. Um, I need to clarify, I guess, in my answer a little bit. We we sell a lot of quarters, halves, and holes. That's probably 60% of our business. Uh, the other 40%, uh, we have a very small percentage that is retail cuts. Um, a lot of our other stuff is ground beef. We have Spencer make beef sticks. Uh, we've been doing summer sausage. Um, more recently, we've done some beef franks. So it's it's ground beef and some processed meats um, that we are selling package by package. Um, I don't want to sit and sort packages of beef. Um, when I get four beef back home, um, my time is worth something to me. And I would, if I have three or four products, maybe six products that I can do that with, that's fine. But I don't want to sort 30 cuts of beef and find a compartment for every single cut of that beef and have to go through and do that inventory process all the time. So like our, um, our ground beef, we do not give discount on, um, the discount that I was referring to in my answer would have been our summer sausage, the beef sticks, um, the beef franks. Um, we've more recently just started working with our local grocery store and in the past have done some stuff at the convenience store we're trying to get back into a convenience store right now so um and I do feel that's it's a I don't know it's a it's a great opportunity I think people when they go into gas stations they like to see that there's a local product in there 
Um, I know like when we go to New Salem to deliver, we always stop at Rude's Oil and there's um, lamb from Freezes in there, their lamb sticks and um, some other local products. So it's, it's nice to see that. And even as we travel across the state, we enjoy um, being able to support other people that are, you know, doing that as well. Good. Um, I guess we'll move on to, oh, uh, Travis posted a question. It says, Spencer, you stated that there are some North Dakota packing plants that are transitioning from custom exempt to either state or USD and USDA inspected. Are these plants seeing value and flexibility of marketing products? Yeah, I think uh, as a processor, getting your inspection um, opens up way more, many more avenues for you as a business to um, create revenue off of what, you know, we'll, we'll use value added uh, as an example, as a custom exempt plant, uh, you're going to have your venison that comes in once a year, which is huge for a lot of these custom exempt plants. You're going to have a, a few random batches here and there for people who want your product and are willing to order the, you know, a 50 pound batch of it. Um, once you cross that threshold and, and become inspected, I see it as a means to create, to continue to create more value continuing down the line. So we can take your product, your ground beef that's worth whatever it is to you create it into something that's worth twice if not more value to you which is you know trickles down the line and that's that's kind of what why I think value added specifically is important and you do see other plants in the um, uh, state that are actually just inspected on the value added side not necessarily the slaughter and processing and um there's just so many different ways to do it, but yeah, I, to answer Travis, Travis's question directly, I think that's the biggest reason why a plant would want to transition is because there is a market where we're sitting here with, you know, two of them for sure, that they need plants that are federally inspected and, and there's a market. There's a lot of people out there who are turning this direct sales into a legitimate business. Yeah, no, uh, that that's a great point. Um, I know that's one struggle my family's had back home is we're having issues finding a federal plant because um, Kansas City is not far away, and it'd be great to get our product to that uh, urban market for sure. Uh, we have another question uh, for Trisha and Donnie. What are you selling whole halves and quarters for, and how much per pound of ground beef? Um, I don't know if we mentioned, but we are 100% grass fed, grass finished. Um, we do not feed any grain. Um, we do feed hay in the winter, obviously. Um, alfalfa, grass hay, and then um, like hay barley. Um, so right now, on our quarters, halves, and holes, we're at 475 a pound, and that's on hanging weight. And that includes cutting and wrapping and delivery within a two hour distance from us. And we'll work with people outside of that. Um, we have had people uh, buy from outside that area and then just go directly to New Salem and pick up there uh, at the plant. Um, ground beef right now, we, and we've been at this price for over a year. It might be a year and a, a year and a half. We've been at $6 a pound on our ground beef. So there again, I, I feel the same way that Beth does. I mean, we we have to make a profit. We have to figure out our fuel to, to haul these animals to the processor, to haul the meat back, to deliver the meat to Dickinson or Watford City or Williston or wherever it is. So you have to value your time at something. Plus, you have to get um, at least what they're getting at the sales barn. Otherwise, what we're doing is not worth doing it, other than the fact that I want to provide local people with a local source of, of meat and protein. And um, so I guess that's kind of where we're at right now. No, that's a, that, 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 that's a good answer. Um, and thank you for that. Uh, do we have any other questions? You can submit them through the chat. You can join through camera or audio. It's uh, up to you. We're pretty flexible here. Um, if there's any questions for our three panelists. We got another one that just came in. 
In Texas, you don't need to be USDA inspected to sell inside the state. It is my understanding that you only need to be USDA inspected if you want to originate the state outside of the state that the animal is harvested in. Um, yeah, no, that's correct. Um, selling within the state, uh, you only have to have state inspection. Um, however, a lot of our producers and both of our panelists here have the opportunity to sell um, to the surrounding states, it sounds like. And uh, doing that, it does become a little tricky uh, getting it to those producers or to those uh, co consumers outside of um, North Dakota for, in this instance. Um, you guys are welcome to add to that. Uh, well, one thing I would add to that for us, our, our house is a mile from Montana. So for us, if we weren't federally inspected, we would basically have one direction to go. And this opens up the opportunity for us to, you know, to go to Baker, Glendive, um, Sydney. Uh, those are probably the main three towns. Um, I've had some people ask for Mile City, but um, we like to kind of keep that two hour distance around us. Um, so the federal inspection is huge for us. Yeah. So can, no. I, uh, can I clarify that question a little more? So yeah. as I understand it, that from Texas, I can have a Texas inspected product and I can ship to any state as long as the originating point of sale is from Texas. But if I move that product outside of the state and then try to initiate the scale, the, the sale, then that's when the USDA gets uh, their pennies in a wad. That, that's how I understand it. So, and the reason I'm bringing this up is, is a lot of people feel like that they need to have a USDA inspected facility, but after you research it further, your state inspected is, uh, can in a lot of cases can be adequate. And then if you're not doing any retail sale, you can go with a un uninspected meat is still, you know, and that's what I do. Most of my stuff with my lamb and beef is I'll have the product, the animal sold before I take it to the plant. So I deliver to the plant. I give them the cut sheet from my customers, got my customer's name on it as well as mine. And then I pick it up and do doorstep delivery. So it can be uninspected meat, have a not for sale sticker on it. And that really saves a lot of headaches for me because I have more flexibility on the, on the facilities that I can use to, to do my harvesting. So other states may be different. So that's what we have in Texas. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, like, like you said, in Texas, it might be different, but um, my understanding here is that uh, it has to be, um, I mean, you can't ship it across state lines. Now, if someone from Minnesota came over uh, to North Dakota, like to the Red River, Har uh, Red River uh, Farmer's Market, where Ron and Beth sell at and bought it, it it's personally... They they bought it and they can transport across state lines. Um, True. Yeah, I could be correct incorrect about that. Um, if somebody wants to chime in, but I believe that's my understanding of it. Gene, as you described, you're selling an animal, and when you sell the animal, then the person that um, picks up that animal um, can take it to whatever state in America that they aspire, because you sold it as an animal and then had it processed there. When an animal is harvested at a state inspected slaughter plant, then that product is not legally allowed to be sold in another state. Okay. All right, we had some more questions in the chat function. Um, for Trish and Donnie, what does it cost to process an animal where you are at? I'm gonna defer this question to Spencer to make sure that I get the correct <laughs> numbers. <laughs> Uh, our rates right now are, um, oh gosh, am I going to remember them off the top of my head? <laughs> I might have to pull up QuickBooks quick. Uh, $90 to slaughter beef. Uh, we have a disposal charge of $35 and then it's a dollar a pound processing on the rail that includes grinding, stuffing, um, and wrapping. We do have additional fees associated with, um, vacuum packaging, um, and anything small further processing like tenderizing, um, patties, things like that are all, all additional fees. But uh, um, that's, the base, that's the base price for beef. An um, in, in interesting uh, 
and Ron and Beth, maybe you'd be able to chime in on this. Lamb is one of those unique things if we're, if we're bringing finance into the equation, because might as well, right? It's kind of fun. Uh, lambs you, you see done so many different ways at, at different plants. And, and uh, I've seen it done you know, multiple ways. We still charge processing lamb based on per pound, but you see a lot of plants moving towards just a blank fee. And that fee includes the slaughter, processing, disposal, everything into one. And, and as a processor, that that's, helps us budget a little better uh, or would per se budget a little better when we're doing lambs because um, I don't know what what uh, your average lambs are dressing out at, but ours are that we do are anywhere from 80 pounds to 120 on the rail. So they're kind of all over the place. Um, so yeah, there's lamb, goats, um, and even pigs. They're, they're just that, that other red meat species is just kind of a different ball game on a price per pound basis compared to beef. All right, um, got another question for Trish and Donnie, Ron and Beth. Uh, with your beef and lamb, how did you work to make or create a label? Did the plant help you with this and, and putting it on your packages for sale? Uh, I guess I'll start a little bit. We have our own logo, and, and then I'll defer to Beth. But so getting to the familiarity and consistency, I mean – we have apparel, we have signs, uh, and I think our logo is kind of unique with a wolf head with a suffix sheep in it. And, and so that is what we try to incorporate in everything so people can equate that and it stands out a little differently. And uh, we just updated it. But uh, so, yeah, we have given them the label, our, our logo, and we had to just, with this last one, we had to pay a new fee to him and he charged us, which is fair enough because they print it and stuff, uh, you know, and puts our phone number or all of our contact information and, and Beth dealt with it a little more and I'll let her find it, fine tune that answer. And, and to start with going all the way back six years, when I first talked to, to Ron Mahoney, who was our butcher at that time, um, he he talked me through what needed to be on the label as far as safe handling and um, the 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 stamp that needed to be on there. He talked us through everything we needed to have on our label, and then from there, um, the first couple of years we did not have our logo on it, and it wasn't until about oh two years ago because this would be the third year that our logo has been on our packaging. And then that was the, the second owners that said, hey, we can put your logo on there if you want. Um, one thing that, that first our ground, they would put just in that, that regular, the pork sausage, the red and white, and it said pork on there, not for sale. And then they'd slap our label on top of it. And I'm like, can we do something different, please? Because this is lamb. This is kind of confusing. So we did end up, you know, going with the white packaging, the little white bag, and then our logo on it. Um, if if you're going to to sell your product, there are guidelines that you have to follow as far as what is on your label, and and that's important that you have all of those things on there, and you talk with your processor to make sure that you've dotted your I's and crossed your T's as far as your label. All right, uh, Trisha and Donnie, you want to build off of that a little bit? Yeah, we kind of have a similar situation. Um, like our packaging before just said fairings grass-fed beef. There was no logo, no, nothing else on there. And that wasn't until after we um, were here in North Dakota processing that that was done. But when, when we bought into six and one meats. Um, we worked with Spencer. Um, we had a logo developed, uh, similar to you guys. Um, and then that is on a label that goes on. Um, we have pound and a half and one pound packages of ground beef. So our one and a half pounders, <coughs> excuse me, are in the white tubes with a label that have our, our logo on them. And then, um, Spencer was able to order custom uh, bags for the one pounders. So 
that actually has our logo stamped right on the, the chub, um, which is kind of nice. Uh, they've been th really nice to have. Uh, and then steaks and roasts, you know, of course, get the same label that the one and a half pounders do. But um, he he pretty much did all of that work for us as far as the, the paperwork, the processing. And, and we're, I mean, very thankful for that because of he has an amazing amount of knowledge in that department. So I defer to him a lot. Nope, that's a, a, that answers that question. Uh, we had another one, um, and all three of you should be able to give some insight into this. Uh, what experience do you guys have with uh, making sausage uh, or getting your processor to make sausage? We actually, the only product that we have that's that way is we have lamb sticks made and uh, very popular because uh, it's 100% lamb. And, and they welcome that. I mean, they have a lot of different variations to that. And, you know, the first year that we tried that, we did both brats and, and, and lamb sticks. And we tried, you know, jalapeno and cheddar. And then all of a sudden it was, well, we raised lamb. And, uh, you know, and they offered it to us. It cost a little extra. But it was like, I don't raise jalapenos. I don't raise cheddar cheese. We're going to go with this. and and they're very easy to work with because like Spencer said, it's all value added. They, you know, they make more money at it. And, and so, you know, their process is available. It's just that you decide, you know, what you want and how you want your product to be presented. And like with lamb, you know, like I said, it's, it's a product that we hundred percent lamb sticks and that's what we're going to stand by. And we probably will add some brats again this year. When we had them a few years ago, they were one of our top sellers, um, but they're more expensive to make. And I am married to a man who's tight with his cash. And so they're more expensive. He's not really going to want to do them. And that's, I mean, I can respect that, but we have some extra lambs this year. So it will be a great way to make sure that, that we get those lambs processed and will make some customers very happy because yeah. they keep bugging us for brats. Yeah, again. the biggest thing is in getting back to making money on it and you throw the processing, all of a sudden four brats at $12 a package, you all of a sudden, you know, my conservative side says, geez, that's a lot of, a lot of dollars for a <laughs> wiener dog, you know, three <laughs> bucks. But people buy them, uh, you know, and with, with lamb or whatever farmer's market, it's seasonal, so... If you're going to have them done, you know, grilling season is when they move easier. And then that's kind of how we have to go with the whole packaging and whatever and kind of go with the seasons and that kind of thing. But that's for a different deal. Uh, go ahead, Tricia and Donnie, if you guys got some experience with it. And... Um, we've done some country style sausage. We started out trying to do that hundred percent beef and our, our meat it, being grass fed is also lean. And I don't mind it being that lean, but I do feel that it's probably a little bit on the dry side. So what we started doing was um, adding, I think, is it 30% pork that you've been putting in at Spencer? I think it's 30, 25. Yeah. 30. Okay. That's what I was thinking. But so we did some country style sausage and then um, we've had Spencer do an all beef summer sausage, which I love. And we do not put any, we don't want any MSG. I don't want any added nitrates or nitrates in anything. So um, try to keep the product as pure as possible. Um, the summer sausage has been amazing. Uh, people really enjoy that. Now we've started packaging it in sliced packages so that we can go to the convenience store with it. And uh, we've done beef sticks, which just we've done an original one. And then we've done a jalapeno one. Um, I know we have some other options, but we haven't really veered outside of those two for the time being. Um, they're good sellers. Uh, they're handy for people. Uh, lunch boxes during the summer. And, uh, and we have a lot of people that even pick them up during the winter, too. Um, you have anything to add? No, just that. Spencer's summer sausage. Uh, if everybody was like my daughter Taylor, we would take Cloverdale out of business. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> she loves it. 
Well, yeah, you want you want to talk about uh, processing sausage as a processor, um, Spencer? If you don't mind giving a little input. Yeah, um, I think it's it's uh, it's unique, and it's it's one more opportunity for you as a meat seller to brand your product. Uh, I'm going to use fairings as the example because. Like Trish touched base on, she uh, uh, or they, their brand is, is, is uncured, right? Which is, um, we, we won't get into the science part of it, but um, it, it's, it's a way to market. And, and you see uncured all over the labels in, in the grocery store now. And, it, and it's becoming, the large plants are really pushing it as well because they see the demand from their customers. Um, and I think it's just it's just such a great way for you to add more value onto your products. Um, Ron and Beth, you said it costs more, and it does because it, it's a lot of more work for us to do as processors. Um, and I think I think, and I have this conversation. I've I've helped probably two three producers start in the past year their own. Re just help them out, you know, get get their labels set up, get all their um, you know, eyes dotted and T's crossed and get everything figured out. And I, that conversation comes up a lot because when they start punching numbers with the, their ground beef is worth $5 and they're paying me two fifty or $3 a pound to process that $5 pound, um, ground beef into ring sausage or summer sausage. And then you're looking at $8, $9 at your cost to get it processed. Um, and that conversation comes up a lot, but to, be able to be sufficient, all parties are efficient and financially successful. All parties have to make their margins and you as the end retailer can't be hesitant to sell for what you need to sell it for. Um, because if, if we don't make our margins on the product, we ain't going to be able to make it for you anymore because it, if we're losing money on it. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to look at it, but you'll, you'll start figuring out different, methods and packaging and, and pricing to where um, it looks better on the eyes. So it doesn't shout out $20 a package for a pound and a half product. But uh, um, yeah, that the, the value is there. And, and if you find a recipe that you enjoy and you are passionate about and you want to market it with your name on it, um, I think that's key. We use uh, a lot of house recipes, which we're lucky that we do because we're able to make sure we keep out those select ingredients that some of our customers don't want to see on that label, like the MSGs. I got some other customers who absolutely don't want any sugar, dextrose, any form of sugar in our product, in their product. Um, so it gives us the flexibility as a processor to kind of twist that recipe around to fit um, the the producers needs we also use a lot of pre-packs from seasoning companies which as a processor helps us be a little more efficient um, to get the product done completed and out the door in a timely manner which becomes very you know difficult of course as a processor and and that's kind of the key in my world is i joke with everybody that we're behind every monday and if and we're caught up by friday and if we're not caught up by friday we got major issues going on um, but yeah, I, it might just be because of my past that sausage is kind of what I'm passionate about. I know, uh, I know a lot about it. I know a lot about it, the science behind it, but, uh, um, yeah, I think it's just a great opportunity for, for all parties involved to, again, add value. Awesome. And then, uh, continuing on with you, Spencer, we had a question that was for you, um, uh, with packaging and labeling. Is there any problems with vacuum seals or labels and how can we ensure quality control of these products? Oh yes. Vacuum packaging is packaging as a whole, even as, as a processor and, and you, uh, those of you who have had animals processed, I'm sure you've had some wonderful conversations with this guy right here, you know, about issues because, um, Vac bags, depending on the product, is the type of vac bag you need to use. And um, just one little tweak with the vacuum bag will cause issues. Um, the, the, the thickness of the bags, there's just so many things that go into it more than just throwing it into a bag and putting it on a backpack machine to make sure and ensure that that seal stays. 
Um, the biggest thing that we battle is bone in product, bone in product with our packaging setup, which is a double chamber vac machine is very difficult. Um, when we package it, it is fully sealed. Everything's fine and dandy. You'll put it in a freezer for two days or a week or however long it takes for the customer to come pick it up. Uh, it's still good, but sometimes during transport, uh, things can happen. And, and that's honestly the biggest issue with vacuum sealing. I, I'm a huge, I mean, you have to vacuum seal. You guys know that you sell retail. You, you have to, your, your customer has to see the product. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's difficult and you got to learn little tricks, not only for us as a processor, but you transporters is just as important as well. Um, label wise, I don't see many issues with the type of labels we use and what comes into play there is at one point of the process, the processor is applying that label. Um, our protocol is, is the label actually goes onto the back bag before the product is sealed so that it has a dry, smooth surface to stick on. And when that product is pulled, that label shrinks with the package. The only downfall to that is if that label isn't perfectly put on the package, which, in, you know, human error, um, it can become wrinkled or, or, or something along those lines. Um, Labeling itself using the different processors and the, the options that they have. Um, we have a labeler that I can upload any image into. I know a lot of processors that use pre-printed colored um, logos or labels. Um, that would be an instance where as a processor, we would charge you. Uh, to get that label made because it can only be used for you. Now, I don't charge people if we're creating a black and white label that my label machine can print on demand because it's just the quick change the file format, upload it into the machine, get it squared away, and, and it goes away. It doesn't, we don't have any additional costs or, or stocking that we have to do in order to make our system work. But again, every processor is different. Awesome. Um, yeah, no, uh, we're getting there to the eight o'clock hour. Um, could, we had great discussion. Uh, can we get a closing statement from each of our panelists before we wrap it up tonight? And we'll start with uh, Spencer since he's still on the screen. <laughs> um, first off, thanks. Thanks, Isaac, for inviting me. Sorry, I uh, didn't email you back. However, many months ago, I, I get busy and I forgot. Um, uh, yeah, there's, there's, I just really want to emphasize that there is so many different ways and options and, and um, availability. And, and there's, there's just so many different things that you as a direct meat sales producer can do. Um, dialing in, focusing on what exactly you want, what you want your product to look like. And Ron and Beth, are, you know, stress that right away. I think that's, that's kind of key as a person who's selling product. Um, figuring out that relationship with your processor to make everybody's life easier and, and more fluid and efficient is, is the name of the game. Awesome. Um, Tricia and Donnie, you want to go next? We'll just go in reverse order. Um, of the way we started. Go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, I think the relationships are like we said before. It's it's huge, and and with your processor and and with your consumer, and I think it's it's all a learning thing. And like we said, uh, the value added side of things. We are like we're trying some different products this summer, and and uh, so we'll learn and and see how we go with that. Um, I think as a producer, I think when you go down this avenue, I think it just opens up so many more different things. And, and, uh, not everybody is, is wants to do that. I mean, uh, there's, there's people, uh, uh Trisha's got an uncle. He, he's fine with great cow calf man, but he sells his calves the last week of October. And he's like, I do not want to look at consumers, you know, face to face. He said, I couldn't do what you do, Donnie. And, 
so it's not for everybody and uh you got to find what your niche is and what you want to do and and i think that's that's the biggest thing to come out with and find products that work for you and and find your avenue and, and ask lots of questions i'll add to that um just keep keep the conversation open between you and your processor um and it's a give and take honestly is what it is it's something like for us we're always thinking i guess and um i'm i'm very glad that spencer mentions other things to us sometimes have you ever thought about this you know and um so that and and be able to uh to understand that you know we're not the ones in the meat plant every day you know processing these animals cutting them up going through all the steps of this and I'm, I'm very, I mean, and as an owner of a processing facility, you look at that a little bit differently. And, and we've, all of our owners have said this from the beginning that we need to make sure that we treat our staff right um, as best we can. And so, because we don't want to be the ones standing there having to cut the meat. I mean, that is not our uh, skills and abilities. Um, Spencer does an amazing job for us. Um, he has a great staff right now, and we're very fortunate for that. So, um, uh, moving on to Ron and Beth. Uh, thank you for coming and joining us, uh, Trisha and Donnie. It was uh, greatly appreciated. Yes, thank you for having us on. And and yeah, thanks Isaac uh, for reaching out to us again. It's always like I said, fun to be part of this, and and to pick up, you know. There's always something to learn from other panelists, but, you know, getting back to our processor and, you know, they try to do the best they can for us. And, and if, if you treat them fairly and respectfully, they're open to criticism or asking, you know, can we try something else? Or, uh, you know, we've thrown some things at Dalton and somebody wanted a French rack and we had no expectations ahead of time. And, you know, we put it together and we took it to the customer and they were excited about it. And the first person we went back to and we reported to him that, you know, what you did was acceptable. Uh, they were excited about it. And, and so not only do we, you know, if we have issues, which Spencer, you know, he brought that up and you guys as co-owners and, you know, customers know that, you know, it's like Spencer said, they're human. Everybody's got a different way. But also make sure that if you are pleased with the product or whatever, to let them know because they're just like anybody else or anything else like that. They always like to hear the good stuff too. And, you know, if you do have a good relationship, heavens knows you want to continue it because, uh, you know, from Spencer's standpoint or any processors, and we've seen this over the years, um, to get your foot in the door. And be a regular, Trish and Don started and stated that, that all of a sudden, you know, that got pulled out from underneath them. And to the, the set up a new one, especially when you have a current business and clientele, could be tough. And so getting back to communication and flexibility and, you know, being up front with each other means a lot. It really does. And, and we've been fortunate in our dealings with this. Well, uh, awesome. Thank you. Uh, this concludes our webinar for the night. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us. It was a good experience and a good discussion tonight. Mm -hmm.